Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is look at the idea of populism and progressivism within the USA. And that's a sort of a, a theme that runs through the sort of 1890s to the 1920s, especially when we talk about the populist party, which was created at the beginning of the 1900s. And we're going to look a little bit about that and about the beliefs that they held and then a number of elections that uh, went on during this period. So as an introduction, as I stated just a second ago, uh, in the 1890s and the 1900s, we saw the creation of this new party. A, uh, oop, there we go. This new party, which was the Populist Party in the USA. And when it comes to the ideas of progressivism, the ideas of progressive politics, we see two presidents that were mainly associated with those ideas. And those were Roosevelt, uh, those were Roosevelt and Taft. Roosevelt was in 1901 to 1908, and Taft was in 1909 to 1913. I'm going to talk a little bit about Roosevelt and Taft in this video and in the next video as well, as well as look at, at McKinley and the influence that he had uh, in the period between the 1890s and uh, when he died uh, in the 1900s. So, what do we mean when we're talking about the idea of populism and the Populist Party? Well, in 1896, populists gained control of the Democratic Party and installed W.J. Bryan as their candidate, okay, their candidate for uh, President of the United States. And in 1890, the National Farmers, as a, a Farmers Allowance created the People's Party. And it was seen as a radical movement, okay? Uh, and they marched out to uh, groups like uh, women. Uh, they tried to reach out to people like that to, to gain support. This was a, you know, a, a, to gain support. So you can't really see that very well, but to gain support. And... People like uh, Mary Elizabeth Lease, who was a lawyer, advocated for the direct action by farmers, okay? And the policies uh, that were demanded from the populist included things like agricultural reforms, uh, graduated income, and also government ownership of railroads. So the nationalisation, uh, nationalisation, nationalisation of rail. And when it's government owned, that means that the government can regulate it. If it's a privatised um, uh, industry, like if railroads were privatised, then you have uh, private companies and private individuals that have influence over the regulation of the rail. And um, there are a number of problems with, well, really, nationalisation and privatisation. But the populist ideas, uh, the populists wanted to see a nationalisation of the railroads, government ownership of rail. When it comes to silver, we see that the uh, production of silver had grown rapidly uh, in the last third of the 1900s. Sorry, that should be uh, 1800s, sorry. Uh, the value increased from $156,000 in 1860 to $57 million by 1890. So there's a huge, significant increase in the la in just a very short period of time when it comes to the value increasing of silver. Uh, the US used the gold standard, okay, and therefore the value was kept high. So the gold standard is uh, measuring the value of something by using a single standard, and they used gold. So as gold, so you would... Um, work out the value of something relative to its gold standard. However, some people did see that uh, there was a desire to use silver in manufacturing uh, when it comes to manufacturing coins, and this would bring the value down. And in 1890, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act forced the government to purchase uh, 4.5 million ounces of sil silver per month. So a, a very, very large... A very very large amount of silver uh, amount of silver uh, per month per month okay however what was important about this act is really that it got repealed by President Cleveland in 1896 so the idea that silver would um, 
you know, would be used in the manufacturing of coins and the uh, Sherman Silver Purchase Act, um, it was eventually repealed. So effectively, uh, things went back to the status quo. When it comes to presidential elections, okay, we're going to look at the idea of the populists and the Democrats, okay, the, the relationship that they had, because um, this populist party was a relatively new party, and, uh, you know, trying to seek their way into uh, influence within the Democratic Party. So the populist party did not do well in the 1892 presidential election. So their candidate only won 22 electoral college votes and you need, I believe it's 270 to win the um, to win the presidency and they only won 22. That's in some cases, that's not even a single state, which is quite, um, you know, quite upsetting for them, I should imagine. Uh, despite not doing great in the presidential election, they still did win. 42% in the congressional midterms uh, two years later. So as you remember, you have presidential elections every four years, and every two years you have congressional midterms. So there was an election for the president in 1892, and then in 1894 there was a congressional midterm election, which midterm just refers to the congressional election between the presidential elections. So you've got 1892, uh, then in 18. 94 you have the midterms and 1896 uh, you have presidential election so you have a presidential election and congressional election presidential election and congressional election and then just the congressional election here and these the one in the middle is referred to as the mid term election just a little bit of american politics for you there there we go so they did quite well in the congressional elections. 42%, you know, is a relatively good amount of the vote. However, ideologically, many of its programs, many of its policies, okay, many of its policies uh, were supported by Democrats. So they ideologically aligned a little bit with the Democrats. And it's for this reason that when it came to the, 1980, uh, so the 1896 election, this one here, the presidential election, uh, the populists agreed to support a Democratic candidate. This was W.J. Bryan. So we see a, 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 merging, a merging of the populists with the Democrats. Populists with the Democrats. They didn't necessarily merge as in they became the same party. However, because they were ideologically... Um, because they were ideologically similar the populists agreed to support the democratic candidate as a way to just try and get people into uh, the election and uh, to try and win the election so when it comes to the 1896 election it was incredibly interesting since it marked a sea change in the methods of campaigning so campaign methods were campaign methods have always been incredibly important so incredibly incredibly important that's what should be said okay and modern campaigning methods uh, were financing and were uh, deployed so methods of financing and campaigning were uh, were deployed and used in this election so it seemed to mark a point where we see more of the modern methods that we see today being used in this election uh, and the Republican campaign uh, raised I should say raised, not raided, up to uh, $3.5 million in campaign revenue. And which, if you think about it, for 1896, that's an incredible amount of money. And there was also a lot of marginal targeting, okay? They had teams with thousands of speakers go out to uh, different areas of the country, okay? So they went to um, the more the more remote remote areas of the country. Because if you think about it, before the invention of the phone and um, the internet and stuff, there were areas in America where the, you know, the the electorate lived that were untouched almost, nearly untouched by you know other people, or very rarely untouched. Okay, and so they need they wanted to get out and get many people from these remoter areas um, to come out and vote for their Republican candidate. 
when it comes to Brian, the uh, WJ Brian, the oopsie daisy, the um, the populist and Democrat um, candidate, uh, he travelled twenty eight thousand kilometers on his campaign. However, this wasn't enough because the GOP, the Grand Old Party, the Republican Party, spent ten times more, and so it was McKinley who won. And uh, spoiler alert, this is an image of McKinley being assassinated, but we'll talk about that in the next lesson. Okay, so as we can see here, uh, we start to see a, a shift in the um, political in the political climate, especially the Democratic Party, when we come to the 1890s and the start of the 1900s.